Today we're going to have a look at how energy moves through an ecosystem, the so-called food chain, or more precisely a food web. And we'll have a look at where we start with this. And we start normally with this idea of a pyramid, a pyramid of biomass. Uh, let's have a look at what we've got. Now, if I take a, an idea and let's draw out a pyramid. Well, not so much a pyramid really as more of a triangle. And when we try and do one of these, it's important to get the idea that we've got a, quite a wide base and at the bottom we have all the primary producers. These are basically the plants, all the photosynthetic organisms that are producing energy from either the sun or some other source. These are fed on by the primary consumers which typically are herbivores. And these eat these. And there have to be less of these than those. In fact, usually considerably less in the way of numbers. Then these are eaten by carnivores and by secondary carnivores. So we've got a primary producer, a primary consumer, a secondary consumer and sometimes a tertiary consumer. Very rarely do we go up more than four what we'll call trophic levels. And why is this? It's because basically we lose energy. So let's take a look at one of my students. Here we go, one of my students. I was talking to her yesterday and she said, well, what's your favourite food? And she said, well, I like lamb. So uh, let's... Uh, take our lamb and I said to her well what do you like eating about lamb she said well I like lots of it really I, I like various things I like leg of lamb I said oh good that that's nice because uh, that consists of things like uh, muscle and bone and uh, what do the bones taste like and she looked at me sort of rather funny and said, well, wrong way. I don't eat the bones. Oh, OK, well, what do you eat? So let's look at this sheep. So this little sheep has uh, been eating lots of grass. So we can put in here uh, the grass that the sheep's been eating. And we've got quite a lot of grass per, per sheep. So, you know, there, there really is lots of grass. And the sheep, you know, I've just got one sheep here. And that one sheep is going to feed her. But um, she said, well, she only liked um, basically the muscle part of this sheep. So uh, let's... Uh, So she she liked that she she gave that a sort of a, a thumbs up, but there were bits of this sort of sheep I've lost it there that she didn't like. Uh, and I said, "Oh, what's that?" And she said, "Well, she basically didn't like you know, the, the the skeleton bit." She didn't eat 
all the bones. Oh, oh fair enough. Okay, that's all right. Um, what else um, didn't she like? Did, did she like eating the brains of a, a sheep? I said, oh, no, don't like that. Don't eat the bones. Don't eat the brains. All right, fair enough. Uh, do you like um, sheep kidney? I said, oh, no. No, don't like sheep kidneys. How about sheep's liver? They're, they're, they're really nice. One of my favourites. Oh, no, she said, don't like that. Oh, OK. Well, how about all the um, the stomach and uh, all the intestines? So, oh, no, I wouldn't eat any of that. OK, we, we went through more bits and pieces and... Uh, Basically, it turned out that uh, the only thing she was prepared to eat was, in fact, a bit of leg. And uh, when I suggested eating some of the, the m muscles on the face or uh, feet, she didn't like the idea of that. So we, we got down to work out that probably only about 20% of this sheep she'd actually be prepared to eat and that meant sort of well down here i suppose about 80 percent of this is uh, is going to waste so we then come to the question well if you're only going to do that um what are you going to use this 20 percent of this sheep that you're eating for, she said, well, there's quite a lot of things. Um, I do quite a lot of uh, running around. Okay, uh, what else do you do besides running around? She said, well, obviously I do breathing and thinking and that sort of stuff. And we'll say, right, well, we'll, we'll call that respiration. Okay, so we've got a lot of movement and uh, we worked out after a while she was also sort of a, a warm human being and she sort of produced heat. Okay, so we've got that. And uh, we got to talking about all this stuff that she ate and we actually worked out some of it came out the other end as waste. And... Uh, We've got this stuff going in and, uh, you know, sort of running around, doing things, respiring, heat, waste. Well, there's not much left, you know, of this sort of 20%. Um, we, we wondered whether, you know, we, we ended up with perhaps sort of 1% left for perhaps growth. Mm. and we also decided that she was sort of she'd grown up enough and she didn't want to grow really anymore so growth one on so uh, we'll, we'll put a cross there and what she just wanted to do was basically repair any sort of broken bits and pieces all the red blood cells that might get damaged her skin that might get damaged and anything else and she felt that was probably okay that only one percent of that sheep that she was eating has been sort of useful to her although as I said well all this other stuff really was quite useful because without that she wasn't going to sort of continue to live and that there were a few more things that she could sort of put down there to think about what would improve her sort of system. So we've got here an idea that as we go from one level to another, as we go up each level, here, some sort of 
energy is lost. Now we know it can't really be lost. It's just converted into something that's sort of less useful. And this magic word here of heat, it sort of causes lots of problems. So let's try and have a look and see how a lot of this sort of works in principle. That was basically a food chain and that gives an idea of something going on to something. But in fact, life is a lot more complicated than that. But let's define a few terms before we start. So our first thing that we have are the producers. Now, what can we say about these producers? Well, they're typically photosynthetic, that they are going to produce most of their energy from simply light, and they're going to combine that with some CO2 and some water. I suppose plus a few minerals and that is where everything starts because nothing that you take in hasn't been made by a producer so now we come to the consumers and what can we say about these consumers well, they get all their energy basically from eating, be it either the primary producer or eating another consumer. So we have our primary consumers, typically the herbivores, and then we've got secondary consumers, tertiary consumers, which are usually predators that will go on here. So they get their energy from eating producers or other consumers rather than by making energy themselves. Now our other group are the decomposers. The saprobonts. Right, these are basically organisms that are going to basically eat dead organisms. I suppose really all dead bits of organisms or I suppose even sort of other things I suppose they're, they're going to eat waste although that really is really part of dead organisms themselves. And what they do here is they're going to basically be important in the recycle phase of this. So these can be bacteria, these can be fungi, they can be small little worms and beetles and other sort of things. We've looked at a food chain, let's try and have a look at a food web because this is much more likely how things are going to go. So let's see if we can start with something. And I'm going to start with my little plant. And here's my little plant. This is Peter the plant. And Peter takes his energy from the sun. We're going to have a nice black sun here. And that's going to provide down here, along with CO2 and H2O, everything 
to start the system off. Unfortunately for Peter, he is besieged by little enemies. And these are the dreaded green fly. Aphids, if you prefer. And these green fly prey upon poor little Peter, the plant, and they literally suck them dry. To our rescue, however, comes a predator for this green fly, and that is our ladybird. So I'll do it a nice red there, and we'll stick some legs on. There we are. I suppose we better label this one. Ladybird, and especially the grubs, and they eat these green fly. But themselves, these ladybirds are preyed upon by other creatures, such as some of my favourite beautiful insects. The dragonfly. Now, Peter the plant also produces some other things in the flowers or little nectar, and along comes a beautiful butterfly. And that takes some of the, the sugary stuff out there. But sitting in my garden, I've got my little frog friend. By the way, I failed art, so you can see why. And the frog, oh yeah, still eats uh, dragonflies as well. We've got other sort of things come along. I, I notice sometimes we get sort of invasions of various different sort of things going on here. And, and we get some other insects going in here. And I get sort of little grasshoppers. And the grasshoppers having a go here. Unfortunately, the, the frog also likes uh, grasshoppers. Um, and then well, we've we've also got nearby nice little rabbit who sometimes tries to come in and sneak some of uh, Peter. The rabbit on the other hand has to be fairly careful because around here we also have the fox and the fox is going to eat that. Uh, Peter's also uh, in, in peril because Peter also produced seeds 
and Peter also is being seeds are being eaten by here sort of uh, let's see if we can do a nice little bird here uh, this this was going to be something like uh, I don't know a blue tit or something like that. I'm trying to do all the ones that I might find in my garden, and uh, this little blue tit. Um, well, they have to keep their eyes open because flying overhead, I've got. I don't see them very sort of going very well, but we've got these sort of buzzards and other things, kites and other bits and pieces. So I've got my buzzard here going, and uh, it might not just be a buzzard, it might be some other bird of prey, and that's going to do that one in. I would imagine if it had an opportunity it would certainly take on the the rabbit or in fact the frog uh, oh yeah I forgot that uh, also in my garden I've got stealing some of the little grain we sometimes have uh, something like a, a little mouse And this little mouse here is, of course, going to eat, well, I suppose, what they like, but basically Peter the plant. And also, they're going to probably be eaten by the buzzard, possibly by the fox. don't think the frog's going to be capable of coping with that. And what we're starting to get here, if I zoom out, is looking like a food web of all the things around in my garden that sort of are eating, destroying, living in the same ecosystem. But I suppose there's, there's a little bit more to this because uh, each of these basically are uh, ignoring what's going on because all of these no matter which one all of these are giving out poop and this stuff is here now wonderful energy for all sorts of other creatures that we might have because down here, I've got the fungi, and they're sort of trying to eat some of this. We've got some bacteria, and they're trying to eat some of those things. The bacteria are actually predators for various things like uh, nematodes. They're going to sort of eat some of these various bits and pieces uh, and I suppose the bacteria are also being fed on by certain uh, protozoa and those nematodes and those protozoa are probably going to be eaten by the earthworm So there it is, it's, it's going to be eaten by the earthworm. The earthworm is also going to probably be eaten by, well, probably not a blue tit up there, but it, it could actually be eaten by 
a bird if I wanted to change that to a, a blackbird or something. Um, but we're getting on there somewhere, so we've got our little fungi. I, I suppose who's going to eat the fungi? Well, I suppose the earthworm's not that bothered really. It's going to sort of do that. And these nematodes and other bits and pieces are probably going to be eaten by various different arthropods. I'm going to get things like, oh, I don't know, all sorts of little bugs in there that are going to eat those things. And we're going to get up to things like some of the spiders and the other arthropods that are going to do those. And those in turn are going to be eaten by our bird of some sort and this is basically returning all the minerals back to the soil so that a piece of the plant can help absorb some of those and recycle the energy and we can see that as we start to do this it gets gradually more and more complex as we go on. One of these food chains is just a, a very much a look at something, whereas the real thing is a complete food web. So this is the reality of the situation. And all of these live in some sort of habitat, which is my back garden. So we've got this idea. Now, if we look at how this works, it doesn't always work out quite as we expect. So let's start off with a pyramid of numbers rather than the pyramid of biomass. Pyramid of biomass, we saw we had a large amount of biomass. But if I look at my pyramid of biomass as a series of numbers, I might find that we've got peculiar systems. Because I might have just one tree. And that is going to support lots of aphids which are going to support a few ladybirds which in turn are going to support possibly one dragonfly. And that is not what we expect because this here is the pyramid of numbers. This does translate, however, to a period of biomass, which is going to look something more like that, with our dragonfly mass, more ladybirds. We're going to have quite a few more aphids, but still the tree has the largest biomass to try and Put all these things together so biomass really important here when we're looking at, at biomass what are we actually looking at well this is the basic dry weight of what we're actually looking for so this is the dry material. So we take out all the water and everything that's not water is stuff that has been made from this particular animal. And this is what we're interested in when we're trying to look at how things go. So what we're looking for, back to my student talking about eating her her lamb 
we're looking at something called the net primary production. NPP. And that is going to equal whatever the gross primary production was which I'm going to call GPP and that is going to be minus respiratory losses and we've got here We'll call that one R. We've got then basically this idea that NPP equals GPP minus R. Now we can look at this slightly differently with another formula and this one we're going to use is going to be that N equals I minus F plus R. Very similar. What we've got here is the net production and I here is the amount of energy that is ingested. So this is our net amount. This is what's ingested. And what we're going to take that away is the stuff that never makes it into the body the feces, urine, all that sort of stuff that's lost and respiration it's probably a better formula for trying to work out what's going on so as we start to look at what's going on we see this doesn't look very good Everything starts from the sun and the sun we know has been around for millions of years and it's doing a blooming good job and we've got here our next idea of our primary producers. Just about had enough room to put that in there. Now, these primary producers have been around for quite a few million years. So you think by now this is going to be quite an efficient system. And how much energy are we going to actually get from the sun? Well, in fact, quite a lot is actually going to be lost by the sun. Um, that's never going to get there. Uh, this is all the stuff that gets stuck in the cloud. Uh, so we do have quite a bit that's uh, going to be reflected. And we're going to have other bits that are going to be absorbed by the atmosphere. So it's not going to get in. So we're, we're going to lose some of that. So how much of the sun's energy is going to go into one of these primary producers and it's horrifyingly only about 2%. That's an awful lot of energy that's actually lost. These plants aren't very efficient. And they're green for instance and you probably know that if a plant's green it means it absorbs blue and it absorbs perhaps other colours like red, blue, but it doesn't absorb green so it just gets rid of that. So all that green light's wasted. Plants really ought to be black if they were fairly efficient. Now these primary producers are fed upon by the primary consumers. And these primary consumers, these are your herbivores typically, 
and most of them are, are fairly efficient they're going to take about five percent maybe a little bit more but not normally and they're going to take about five maybe ten percent of the energy the secondary consumers are going to eat these primary consumers Now they get a richer food source, so let's let's be generous here, and let's say they get out about fifteen percent of their energy, and then these go on and are eaten by the tertiary consumers. These tertiary consumers, I suppose they're quite efficient, they're taking 15% as well. We're losing all the other energy out here. Basically, we're losing quite a bit here. Could draw it in red, I suppose. As heat. So we're losing quite a bit there going out as heat. And we're losing other stuff as basically, I suppose we'll do a pretty blue, why not? And these are going here to our decomposers. And again, they're not going to take an awful lot of energy out of that system. Let's say for those, they're going to get 10% of the other rubbish that's going to go out. So, all in all, here, we've got a system that's not particularly efficient. We've got only 2% of the sun's energy and then 5% of that and then we have 15% of that 5% and by the time we get down virtually all the energy has actually been used up and ends up as heat so as we go through each trophic level here more and more energy is actually being lost as heat until basically it's all gone so we could also look at perhaps another equation here and something that is called our ecological efficiency And this is basically our idea of the energy that we've got, or biomass, take, take your choice really, after the transfer. Divided by the energy here before the transfer and I would multiply that by a hundred percent to try and make some sense of this and we start looking at what we've got here so if you eat a thousand and you only get 200 out then we're looking at an efficiency of about 20 percent so Basically, we have lots of calculations that we can try to work out. We can work out 
the gross production of grassland. We can estimate the respiratory loss and so we can work out our net production. So if we choose one of these and say that our gross production is going to be about 60 grams per metre and respiratory losses is going to be about 20 so overall we'd only make 40 grams per metre and that would be our primary production and then this we will lose as we go up here and a better formula so we've got taking into account how much stuff we lose as well as faeces as well as respiration and we, we can fine tune this but it gives the same basic idea as we go on that basically as we look at a system it's quite frightening if I try and put a few numbers on some of these about how much comes in compared with how much that goes out and it's quite frightening that we might have numbers in the region of perhaps a hundred thousand kilojoules per meter coming in but only about 50 or so at the end because of how each time energy is lost in the system. We can have a few problems with this I suppose because humans sort of normally sort of manipulate these biomasses and they, they try to change the systems of how they work and we generally call that agriculture. So what does agriculture do? Because basically us humans basically rely on agriculture. Now, so what's agriculture trying to do? Well, it's basically here manipulation. of not just the environment but perhaps of plants as well and domestication of certain animals so we've got these things to try and help us we are adjusting their abiotic systems so that they've got a better environment to live in we've got rid of some of those rocks so we've got more space for things to grow and we can also change some of the biotic systems here I can get rid of some of the pest diseases that are going to cause these things agriculture then is designed to try and get rid of these food webs and make much simpler food chains. What we're after really is something like wheat and that's going to go straight into man or we might try grass into cattle, sheep pigs, whatever it's going to be, into man. And this is trying to sort of make things better. We've got this one, which is much more efficient. This area here of trying to do things means that we can use, grow more energy here because there's less trophic levels to lose it in so this one is much more efficient and this is how man has manipulated the environment so that 
we could survive better. Just two trophic levels here. Or here, three trophic levels. So we're losing less energy in the system. And probably making it harder for everything else to sort of survive in the process, really. So we've got lots of these different types of biomasses to have a look at and we can see that when we start manipulating the environment sometimes we get it right and sometimes we get it wrong. A good example of getting it wrong was Australia. There they had quite a good ecosystem. They've been established and working for thousands of years if not even longer. And then we came along and we decided we wanted to live in Australia and that we'd like to have sheep and they're in competition with something else. And people introduced rabbits and they had some problems so we put some dogs in to eat the rabbits and the dogs escaped and then the dogs are starting to eat all sorts of other things that we don't want and they can try all sorts of wonderful ideas but generally when man has a go at trying to sort of modify the ecosystem it just doesn't tend to work quite as well why not well we, we, we don't look at how things work there is the story about Yellowstone National Park where we got rid of all the wolves because they're frightening and they, they might hurt some people but then that meant the deer population, it rose, and that started changing the ecosystem. And only by some people being intelligent and putting back some wolves did it restore the balance much more and get it more sorted out. So we have to look at ecosystems quite carefully to see how these food chains, these food webs, these trophic levels they all interfere and relate to one another because you can't change one thing without affecting some of the others. I hope that helped. I hope that gave you some idea about food webs and how they interact with the ecosystems, how they fit in with the biotic and abiotic features. And next time we'll have a look at a little bit more about what goes on in these ecosystems and until then take care stay safe subscribe if you found this useful and i'll see you next time bye bye